Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. The, um, it's really nice to see such uh, a crowd uh, come out for a topic like this. Uh, it's also an amazingly diverse group of people, which is at the essence of what we're going to be talking about tonight, diversity. The, um, the current crisis on this globe is, in some ways, it's not new. Uh, it's deeply human. But at the same time, there's new dimensions to the crises. Technology is certainly one of them. It's had a huge impact on us as a species. We now know and can see all over the world what's happening to other peoples. In the past, you could live relatively, uh, relatively peaceful in a place if you were fortunate. I'm sure the Ohlone Indians here 300 years ago did not know about all the problems that were happening, uh, for instance, uh, in the Middle East at the time, whereas now we do. We see all these problems, and it becomes a little overwhelming for people generally to deal with that. We're, we're, as a species, we're probably not uh, designed to have this type of crisis overload one after another, and uh, hence a lot of people uh, literally turn off. The verses that were recited uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the chapter called The Table Spread, Al-Ma'idah in Arabic is actually, there has to be food on it to be a Ma'idah. Uh, if it's not, it's called Khuwan. Um, so that, that, those verses are very interesting verses because they, uh, for this topic, because they're basically essentially telling us that God has given each group a, a shara, uh, a law, and a minhaj, which is also a Hebrew term, a methodology or a way of applying that law. And, and it says, had God wanted, he would have made all of us one community. But in order to test you, he's made diversity. And then it says, فَاسْتَبِقُ khairat, Vie in virtue with one another. Vie in virtue. There's many verses in the Quran. And then after that, it says that God will explain why you were differing on the Day of Judgment. So there's this idea of just deferring until the Day of Judgment what these differences are about. Because humans will differ. We've been given intellect and we have free will and we reason for ourselves. So we're going to differ. That's part of the human condition, difference of opinion. And the Muslims developed a very sophisticated uh, art called the art of differing, uh, the adab of ikhtidaf, the, the, the courtesies, the comportment, the decorum that goes with differing. And there was a whole a system that traditionally you needed to learn before you could get into a debate with another and part of it was just respecting the other's opinion and listening to it before you made your own judgments. Um, obviously civil discourse is at the essence of a civilized society. From one perspective the Quran is an argument. It, it's an attempt to persuade us of its truth and it leaves open its rejection. I mean, this, it can't be a real argument if there's no possibility of rejecting it. So, whoever wants to believe in this, let him believe, and whoever wants to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. That this is a choice. And that's a really important aspect of the Quran. In a society where we need to live together uh, civilly, we want persuasion to be a verbal power and not a military might that imposes on others. What you're seeing now in the Muslim world is attempts to impose ideas on other people. There's been a lot of despotism in the Muslim world for a long time that's created a certain environment. There's an immense amount of tribalism and tribalism is at the essence of a lot of the problems. Our Prophet said him once, um, one, the Ansar got into a fight with one of the Muhajirin. Some, in one riwayah, they were actually young. They were teenagers. And the, the Ansari, the man from the indigenous people of Medina, called out, Ya lal Ansar, oh Ansar people, come help me. And then the Muhajiri, the immigrant, called out, Ya lal Muhajir, Muhajirun, oh you uh, immigrants, come help me. So they came out ready to duke it out. And the Prophet heard this and he went out. 
And he said, in my presence, you're going to call to this jahili, this ignorant call? And then he said, muntina. Leave this, this ignorance because it's a foul thing. And then he said, help your brother, the oppressor and the oppressed. And they said, how do we help? We know how we can help our brother, the oppressed, but how do we help our brother, the oppressor? And he said, by stopping him from his oppression. So he was teaching them something very important that many, many places in the Muslim world, they've forgotten. The idea of truth is what we should be pursuing and not what is called in the Hadith Asabiya, this fanaticism, this zealous uh, belief in the superiority of your own group. I was involved, and I've been a student of Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayez now for over 20 years. When he saw the Christians and the, uh, the, all of these different uh, groups being persecuted in certain places where civil society had broken down and uh, there was a collapse, failed states, he, he wrote a, a policy paper uh, and then he uh, convened, it took him three years because he got together about 250 of some of the top scholars in the Muslim world and he debated with them. And I was in on several of the debates, debates they were fascinating. Uh, one particular one that I'll mention revolved around the particle min, in, in, which is a, it's a preposition in, in Arabic. And, and it re revolved around that and another about ma, the, 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 the uh, preposition ma, with debating about hadith, about how you could interpret this hadith when it says the Jews are a community with the Muslims. What does that ma mean? Because Ibn Hisham gives several possibilities. And he was making an argument. And he actually convinced uh, one of the most notable scholars in Pakistan uh, of his position based on the possibility of interpreting this and this is why language was so important to the Muslims, because in order to communicate, we have to, we have to be speaking a language and recognizing the nuances of language. Because Arabic in particular is an extremely nuanced language, but all languages have subtleties and nuances, and if we lose sight of that, we lose the ability to communicate with, with one another. And then the idea of seeing the other person's perspective is very important. There's a, uh, a story that they tell in the Middle East of uh, Mullah Nasruddin or Joha, where he was on the side of a river and there was another man on the other side and the, the man called over to him, how do I get to the other side? And Mullah said, you're already on the other side. <laughs> and, and the point of that is we often fail to see the other person's perspective. He was looking from his perspective, but the other man was looking from his. And so in order for us to be able to understand each other, we have to, in a sense, get in the other's shoes. There's a beautiful uh, ayah in the Quran when the Prophet is commanded to discuss with his interlocutor. It says, It says, either I or you are guided. In other words, let's Come together and talk. And that O is a very interesting O because O in Arabic can mean a lot of things. That one's called harfu uh, atfan lil ibham. It's a very interesting O because the Arabs have all these ways of speaking where they have multiple exit strategies. <laughs> and, and, and this is very important in, 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 a, in a society where you have tribalism and where what you say can actually get you killed. There's a famous story about one of the Khawarij, who wrote a poem, and it said, you know, Waminna Amirul Mu'minina Shakib, you know, and amongst us we have the, the, the Amir al Mu'minin Shakib. Well, they caught this man, he was brought before the Caliph, and he said, How dare you say that you have, I'm the Amir al Mu'minin, you're claiming you. He said, No, no, I said, Waminna Amir al Mu'minina Shakib. He changed it from the nominative case to the accusative case which switch the meaning, as if he's addressing the actual Amir al mumini These are examples of how language was very important in getting people out of problems. And we were just talking earlier about 
the, the Oxford comma, also known as the Harvard comma if you're American. Um, the, uh, a $10 million lawsuit over the omission of a comma in, when you have three things together and you have an and. Some people say you should add a comma for clarity. So these truck drivers who were either grammarians or they got a lawyer who knew grammar um, were able to get $10 million in overtime uh, a lawsuit against this company because of the omission of a comma. So in a civilized society, language is extremely important. And this is why Sheikh Abdullah, in three years, he worked with these scholars, and it was all over language. And from that came, we, alhamdulillah, I translated his uh, paper, and then he has the Marrakesh Declaration, in which he argues that jizya, which many Muslims think is the way that you deal with peoples of other faiths, that they have to pay jizya in submission based on chapter 9. There's a verse in the ninth chapter of the Quran that says that other peoples have to pay jizya. The sheikh makes a very cogent ar argument that that was only one possibility. And, and he gives historical precedent for other possibilities, not just from Umar ibn al-Khattab, the, the second caliph, but from the practice of caliphs after that. There are periods where the Umayyads were actually paying the Byzantines to guard uh, the borders. So he makes this argument, but one of the things that he says, and, and I, I, I'll just uh, end with two things, so because I really want to also hear myself. We have two really distinguished scholars uh, here tonight, uh, Dr. Andrew March from uh, Harvard and Dr. Uh, Maria the cake uh, from George Mason. Uh, both of them wrote very, very excellent articles in, in this. But Sheikh Abdullah bin Beya says in his uh, paper, he says that we have to take into account historical developments and the social and human context. He says developments and changes over time as well as contemporary societal realities present a set of circumstances that differ from those in which the particularized rulings were originally revealed. Social context remains the premise upon which we determine the suitability of a legal ruling's application. In other words, text and context cannot be separate. And this is the traditional juristic methodology of our civilization. Hence, our context today demands a novel reading of sacred law in light of the foundational and universal building blocks of legislation. In addition, we must view all of the political, social, economic, scientific, and technological realities. Today, we have international accords, borders, weapons of mass destruction, and religious, cultural, as well as multi-ethnic communities in both Muslim-majority lands and those beyond. In our context today, social contracts have replaced tribal and religious allegiances, and in in the international domain, the domination of superpowers has been replaced by the interdependence of nations with international treaties and accords that for all intents and purposes hold up relatively well. Globalization has emerged as an ongoing reality of our world and not just a fleeting trend. And although it is framed in a way that allows one to take it or leave it, in reality it compels itself on us all. This current context impacts not only in the international institutions and laws, but also the continued appropriateness of the sacred texts, regardless of their original reasons and circumstances in which they were revealed. And here is the important point for me. In light of this, no room for romanticizing history remains. We must abandon all delusions of empire for the Muslim community and nostalgia for past military might and victory or what should have been done but was not. We must also abandon any and all aberrations and illusions that have currently framed the Muslim community as in opposition to humanity instead of remaining as it originally was, a contributor to the advancement and development of civilization. Our world no longer identifies itself in religious terms. Instead, it identifies itself through culture, personal and social interests technologies, covenants, contracts, and treaties. But this does not mean that people are not devout and religious. Make no mistake about it. A mistaken diagnosis is fatal. The realities of our context today do not allow for the old categories of religion. As the world today is multicultural, its contribution of pluralism itself a virtue 
provides immense opportunities for humanity to achieve a lasting and natural state of peace. And in conclusion, he identifies the social values of Islam. It's very interesting because in, in the Catholic tradition, St. Thomas Aquinas also deals with the social virtues, and many of them actually dovetail uh, with the Islamic. The first is gentleness and benevolence. The Quran says he does not forbid you to deal gently and justly with anyone who has not fought you for your faith nor driven you out of your homes. God loves the just, 60, 80, 8, verse 8. The second is dignity. And the Quran, interestingly enough, differentiates between ontological dignity, which is the essential dignity of a human being. Just simply for being human, you have a dignity, irrespective of what you do and who you are. Even the worst criminal is entitled to ontological dignity. And that's just the dignity of being human. And this comes from a verse in, in uh, the 17th chapter called Beni Israel or Isra. We have dignified the children of Adam and carried them by land and sea. The moral dignity, which is the second type of dignity, is, is in the 49th chapter of the Quran, where it says, Inna akramukum inda that the most dignified amongst you are the most conscientious, the most pious. That's moral dignity that's acquired. Ontological dignity is not earned. It's given to you by God by simply being a, 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 a a creature of God that's endowed with, with uh, rationality and, and humanity. Third, cooperation, solidarity, and rectification. Help one another to do what is right and good. Do not help one another towards sin and hostility. Quran chapter 5, verse 2. Do not corrupt the earth as after it has been set right. 756. Do not seek to spread corruption in the land, for God does not love those who do this. God knows those who spoil things and those who improve them. So cooperation, solidarity, and recti uh, rectification. That verse, the first one of cooperating in goodness, was actually revealed concerning the polytheists of Mecca to work with them. It wasn't revealed for the, for the Muslims to cooperate with one another. Reconciliation, make things right between you, 8-1. Human solidarity and interaction, people. We created you all from a single man and a single woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should get to know one another. In God's eyes, the most honored of you are the ones most mindful of, of God. And this is a basis of interaction between people, not dominance, as is found in the Hegelian dialectic that is predicated upon perpetual dominance based on the master-slave theory of Hegel. Six, wisdom. Whoever is given wisdom has been given much good, and only those with insight bear this in mind. Quran, chapter 2, verse 269. The common wheel. We will not deny those who work for rectitude their just rewards. So working to, for the common weal, common goodness. Eight, being just with others. God commands to justice, doing good and generosity towards relatives, and, and he forbids what is shameful, blameworthy, and oppressive. He teaches you that you might take heed. Number nine, mercy. It was only as a mercy that you were sent. And this is why you have to have, if you have social justice, you also have to have social mercy. You can't you know, Rawls, John Rawls, and I think Dr. Marshall will probably bring him up. He brought him up in his article. But John Rawls argues that the most important virtue of a society is justice. But the Muslims would argue that the most important is actually love. And Raghavid Spahani says, reiterating what Aristotle said, he says in his Akhlaq, he says, when you have love, people forego justice. And that's why a family is based on love because families oppress each other, but you're still uh, family. And then peace, which peace and even higher principle and value remains lofty and in reality. Oh, you who believe enter wholeheartedly into a state of peace. And one of the things that's quoted a lot, no, no peace without justice. If you look at Dr. King's original statement, he actually said, there can be no justice without peace and there can be no peace without justice. You have to see both together. If you say no peace without justice, we'll never have peace. It's just gonna be conflict. And this is why it, the Kantian iteration, he differentiates between temporal peace and perpetual peace. No, no peace without justice is perpetual peace. But temporal peace is where you work for justice within the, within the, the the, uh, the environment of peace. And finally, covenants. Fulfilling covenants 
is considered a sign of true faith. O you who believe, fulfill your obligations. If they seek help from you against religious persecution, it is your duty to help them. So these are some of the ideas that Sheikh Abdullah is introducing or reintroducing. And I would just say, he is not a modernist by any stretch. This is a man deeply steeped in tradition, and he's working from the tradition of the great Usuli scholars. Imam al-Qushayri, the, the great theologian and, uh, and Sufi, said that the Usulis are the generals of this ummah. They're the people that give the strategy. You know, strategos is the Greek word for general. They're the ones that look down the road. So we have, inshallah, a wonderful conversation uh, in store uh, with some really exceptional uh, scholars, Dr. March and Dr. Dakeik. So um, I think, yeah, yeah, bismillah. Mm -hmm.